Sorry for the delay, folks. Wow. Uh, had a meeting that ran late, so thanks for bearing with us. All right. And oh, let's go.
What is, why are we adding 4 to the AX? Yes, we're trying to get the second, so we're accessing RV bracket 1. Right, so when we're adding four to a, one to a pointer, we're moving it forward four bytes because the pointers are four bytes. <coughs> we then dereference EAX and move it into EAX. So here we have the parentheses, right, which remember means dereference. So now we're going to go to wherever EAX now points to, which should be what now? It should be argv1, right? So this should be an address that points to some string that we passed in as part of argv. Then we move this EAX value, this string value, onto the ESP plus 4. Why ESP plus 4? Setting up the arguments for string copy. So argv1 is the second argument, so it's going to go first on the stack. And then we can assume that the next thing we'll do is take the address of foo and put it as the second argument right at ESP. And if we look, that's exactly what happened. So we loaded effective address of EDP minus 32 hex, and we copy that into EAX. Right? So already said it, this is going to be where foo is located, right? Who is located? We know it's a local variable because it's a negative offset of EDP. We move that into EAX and we move that onto the stack. Finally, we're going to call the string copy function, which we're going to ignore for now, like a black box. <coughs> then we're going to move 10 into EAX. We're going to leave and return. Right. Pretty simple program. Any questions? So here I'm running a Python script 
The dash C means don't execute a Python file, just use the string as a Python file. And all I'm doing is printing out these characters. So the nice thing, other languages do this too, Python is the only one. But if you put the slash X, that is, will print out the, uh, the character that has that hex value. So we'll print out hex 31, hex C0, hex 15, hex 68. And assuming we have no nulls in here, right, this string that's inside the single quotes will be the input, the argv1 to our program. <coughs> Move dereferences. So move would take the four bytes that are located at EDP minus four. <coughs> now there's nothing, so let's say it's zeros. It'll move zero into EAX. The load effective address does not do a dereference. It says take what, is that why it's load the effective address, right? Not like actually move and dereference something. So take the value that's inside the, uh, what is it, ED, EDP register and subtract 32 hex from it and copy that value into EAX. So we move down. So now we've 
almost set up our frame. So now we're going to move the stack pointer into the base pointer. So now we'll have a red base pointer and a blue stack pointer. Because now we're setting up our stack frame. So we saved the previous base pointer. We then copy the <coughs> stack pointer into the base pointer. And then now we are going to create space for our local variables. Anybody know what hex 3C is? Yes. Can somebody do it? That's more like I can somebody do it, so I don't have to switch program. I mean, you have computers with calculators. 60? Okay, cool. 60. So we're going to move down 60 bytes. I think I did this right. And so remember, the only things that are changing here are the stack pointer. So the stack pointer, now the value is uh, BF, FF, F65C. And the instruction pointer is now pointing to the next instruction we have to use. Yeah. On the test, like, can we have like text numbers or something? Like, we have some method to convert them. I mean, yeah, you multiply the 10 place by 16 and then add it. So we'll just have to do it on the paper and everything? Yeah. Like, can't calculate no, no calculators. Okay, then, all right, so then the next thing we're doing is moving EDP plus C into EAX. So what's EDP plus C here? So here's EDP, the red, we have 4, 6, C is 12, 12. So we're copying this value, remember, and we're doing a dereference here, we're doing this move. So this is the important difference between this and a load effective address, right? We have very similar instructions here at this line and at this line. But on this one here, we're moving this value that is at EDP plus C. So EDP plus C is whatever BF, FF, F698 plus C is, which would be that, that, that. It's super impressive when I do that in my head, but I can't. We're taking the value in there and we're copying it into EAX. So EAX will now be BF, FF, F734. Okay. So this is argv. So we've copied argv into uh, EAX. We then increment argv by 4 because we're doing pointer arithmetic. We'll remember, argv points to the first argument, right? But it's a list, it's a character pointer pointer, right? It's pointing to a list of character pointers. So to get to the Index one, we have to increment the pointer four bytes from where it currently is. So we're going to add four to EAX, and you'll notice that these are off the stack somewhere at the top, right? So we have them around the stack there. I, mean, I guess I could have done that, but that would be too much. They exist there. Now we're going to dereference EAX and copy whatever is at the memory location that is inside EAX into the EAX register. So here we're going to look and say, hey, what's at memory location BF, FF, F738? Copy that value back into EAX. So we do that, and we can see it's at BF, FF, uh, F87B, and you can use cool GDD commands. Uh, so this is GDD syntax, the X means examine. So examine does a pointer direct, uh, looks at a memory location. So examine at this memory location that's on the right. The slash x tells it how to interpret that data. So should it interpret it as a hex value, as a string, as an integer, what size, you can give different sizes. Uh, if you, so x slash wx means just print out one value in hex here. Uh, you can put 20x and it would print out 20 values in those memory locations after starting at 738. Uh, super useful for analyzing and looking at memory of a running program. And so we can see that, yes, GDB is telling us that at this memory location is this value. And so that is why this value is now in EAX. Cool. Questions on this? All right. Then we're going to move EAX into ESP plus 4. So we're moving it onto the stack here. Now we're going to load effective address and calculate EDP minus 32 and put that into EAX. So EDP minus 32 is 
I put it here because there's like a lot of space here. This is should have a disclaimer, this diary stack is not drawn to scale. Right? So there's like a lot of stuff in there, and somewhere within there, there's BFF F666. Right? But how exactly how many bytes is that from the base pointer? 32 hex, which is how much? 50. So it's exactly 50 characters below. And I believe it's actually one of the uh, arguments that I used to GCC. The, oh, there's like some alignment argument that caused it to put that exactly 50 bytes below and, and um, instead of like 52 or additional space there. Because remember, the buffer was size 50. So then we move EAX into e ESP, so now we have the value here. And if we look, so this is another way, so you can examine and print it out as a string, what's at BFFF87B, and we can see that there is this string. So why does it look so weird? It's instructions. Yeah, so there's not ASCII characters there, right? It's actually just bytes. Um, you can actually do something really cool. Oh, maybe, did I see this or no? Let's go now. We'll see if there's next. Uh, you can do x slash 20i, lowercase i, and that will interpret whatever there as x86 instructions. So that's actually a cool way to debug your shellcode, is you can run that on an address, and there you should see your shellcode commands uh, that you use to compile, like, that are actually there. Uh, so that's actually a super helpful technique if you get into, I've seen super weird problems come up. So, now we're about to call string copy. So, what's the source argument to string copy? The first or the second? The second argument. And so on this diagram, which memory address is the second argument? Plus the four for the saved uh, base. Where do you get fifty from? The size of the array, which is uh, no wrong. Well, it's also aligned, like you said, or whatever. Yes, this number right here tells you. So this is why the source code can lie to you, and you should not trust it. You always want to look at the assembly. So yes, you're correct. It is size fifty. But really, we know from looking here that the buffer foo is at EVP minus thirty-two hex, and we know that's fifty. So we know that from here until here, there are 50 bytes. And then what's after that? <laughs> Four bytes of save EVP, which we don't care about, we can erase. And then we get to our beautiful save DIP that we want to destroy. So when we copy this, this is only a copy. So how many bytes in this stack get overwritten. So I just showed you down here. There's also another cool thing in GED. You can run like string length and other functions here. So this is printout. So instead of the X here, X is examined. So treat it like an address and show me the memory there. Print, print out the actual value of X. So print out 
the string length of this buffer. So, then how many characters did I write here? Is that hex 21? 33? Why 34? There's a null byte at the end. There's a null byte at the end, yes. It's always easy to forget the null byte. But remember, we're copying a string from one place to the other. So string copy will copy all the bytes of the string and also place a null byte at the end. Right, so we're technically copying 34 bytes in there, but this is all well within the buffer we have allocated, right? We have 50 bytes here. So we move A into EAX. We leave, which remember does a uh, set the stack pointer equal to the base pointer, then does a pop EDP. So the culmination of that is the stack pointer will point here, and the base pointer will get whatever is on the stack of the state of EDP. Hit zero. And then when we return, where are we gonna, what's the instruction pointer going to be? It's like B7, E3, FA, F3, right? And the stack pointer will also move up one. And then something else is going to happen. We're fine here. So what went wrong? I put my shell code in the program. Yeah. You didn't have shell code to call the buffer overflow to overflow. Yeah, I didn't actually trigger a buffer overflow, right? I just threw shell code into a program, right? And so we must overflow the same DIP on the stack with the address of the shell code. Right? That's the other critical component because we want control to go not to the function that calls main. We want it to go to our shell code that we just put onto the stack. So how do we do this? Yes, so how much? So we know, so how much in the buffer, so we know that there's, how big was the buffer? And how, how many bytes are there from where the buffer is located to the EDP, the base pointer? 50, 32 hex. They happen to be the same, but they don't always have to be, right? So we have 50 bytes, then four bytes for save EDP, and then now we are at the save EDP. So what we want to do, so the buffer is exactly at EDP minus uh, hex 32. So we need our 33 bytes of shellcode, right? Remember, we have to forget the null byte now because we want to copy, we want to create a string that will not only inject our shellcode into the process, but will overwrite that EIP. Let's say the EIP. So we need our 33 bytes of shellcode. We need 17 random bytes by 17. Because it needs to be 30, right? We're going to fill up that buffer. Right? So, do you really want to use random bytes? Yeah. No. What if you have zeros or shell, like new lines? Like, just use something simple like A's, or you can be fancy if you want, but you know. A character, pick your favorite character. It's the first letter of my name, I was like, do A's, but uh, that's just like a personal thing. Every, almost everyone does this. So, all the exploits will see this. Then we need four bytes of what? Yeah, more, four bytes of more junk, but this is going to become the same PDP. And then we need four bytes for the address of the shellcode. So back in our other example, what was the address of the shellcode? Yes, BF, FF, F6, 66. Six. Cool. So we don't have to compile it again. I don't know why I put that back. We can debug it. So now we can run this program with, here's our shellcode, and then 17 lowercase a's. So this is literally the only time I've seen Python's uh, string multiplication ever be useful. It's like the world's dumbest feature. Like, yeah, it should definitely be multiplying strings by integers because that makes sense from a type perspective. But this is literally the only time that comes in handy. That's actually super handy, so I hope they don't like ever take it away. But it doesn't make any sense if you think about it. Anyways, 
So we have the buffer there. We have 17 times A, so we have 17 A's. Then we have, I'm going to put here B, C, D, E as what's going to be in E, D, D, uh, the safe base pointer. And then we have our address. We have B, F, 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 6, 66. All right, so just like before, we can, this time I'm going to, this time, oh, this is this. So I'm going to put a breakpoint on the uh, call function. We're not going to step through every single part of the call function. You should be able to do that on your own now. So here's the call function. What's different? Play game. Who can spot the differences? You know those games? They're like the two pictures. This was you had a picture 30 seconds ago. Yeah. Is the memory different? Is the memory different? How different? All of it? Did my program location change? Yeah. My program location changed? No, that's the location the stack. The stack, what about the stack change? So do you all agree that the stack change, or is it just a trick of your mind? Yeah. The 646 used to be 666. 646 used to be 666. Yeah, so it seems like there's been 32 bytes moved around. Yeah. F-A-X-3 was, I think that was the value before. Yes, that value is exactly the same. The value of where to return to, which kind of makes sense because if you looked into it more closely, you'd see that that's a library function, so the library always gets loaded at the same location in memory. So our code doesn't change, the library code's location doesn't change. So you've detected that it changed, why? talked about the application's process space. So what actually is above? So I'm basically at the main function here, right? So I'm here, and I have my arguments here, or arg c, an arg v vector, an environment pointer, right? So where is that data? Right? Where is the string that I pass in? Where is this? My So this is the address of rv1. Right? And these are the actual bytes. Where are they located in my process's memory? On the stack above me. right? And if we go back to that diagram we had of the stack, we said, hey, all of the environment variables and the argv parameters are put on the stack. And then there's the arg, uh, probably the environment p pointer, and then the argv pointer. And then there's uh, these arguments. right? So. What's the difference? What did we do differently between when we ran it then and we ran it now? Our input's longer. And we know exactly how long extra length it is, right? It's 17 plus 8. Right? So if you think about it, when the operating system created this process, right, and it's setting everything up to call main, it had to put in more data in the top of our stack in the argv, wherever the arguments live. Right? It had to put an extra, what do you say, 17 and 8? Um, it had to put those extra bytes on the top, which pushed the entire stack down. What else lives in the environment? So this actually doesn't live in the environment. So uh, this is in the argv vector, but all of the environment variables are there too. So what else is in that the environment? Yeah. Whatever gets passed in by the program. Yeah. So there's everything that gets passed in by the program. So the argv vector. There's also let's look at this. sensitive in my shell? Nah, you're good. <laughs> mm. Yeah, before recording that though. Well, oh, I'm going to So ENV prints out the environment. There we go. Okay, yeah, that's good. Right? 
So I have, what kind of things do I have in here? The shell, I have which user I have, I have this ls colors thing, which I'm not really sure what that is. I have the fact that I'm running this as a pseudo user. I have my path. I have also my present working directory, right? So this means that my environment will change depending on where I run the commands from, which means that the stack will change depending on where you are running a command from and what arguments you are passing to it. This is something that can be incredibly annoying when you're trying to do a buffer overflow and get it very precise. Talk about ways to deal with that. So, now, when I copy this over, right, now instead of just overflowing the buffer itself, I'm overflowing with my shellcode at this address, bffff646, shellcode, and then, oops, that should be 17. Oh, yeah, that's right. And the first time I did this, I did it wrong. I calculated based on 32 instead of 50 or something. Or no, I think I had seven. Whatever, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter, okay. This should be right, so it should be 17. Right? So I do this now. 33, 17, yeah. Yes, that's right. I originally had my shell code not today. Oh, that's right. I was using hex 21, and I used 21 as the number of bytes in the shell code. Is that right? <laughs> Super easy to fix. So look at that. You'll never know what's there. Right? So what else changed? Yeah, so we have not only, so we can see that the save EBP changed, and how did that change? What was the value that I put on the command line for EBP? What was it? B, C, D, E. What is the byte for B? Jump into the middle of the shellcode, 
And I need to jump exactly to the shout code in order to get this right. So if we go forward, we'll see we get a setting fault, and it'll be here. And it'll say exactly, hey, I couldn't access this memory. I tried to access BF, F6, FF, BF. And if you do info registers, it'll print out all the registers, and you can see that EIP has this value which means that, okay, we almost got it correct, right? But the problem was, A, the stack chain, and B, we didn't take into account the ND in this. So let's fix it. So now we do 4.6, F6, FF, BF, because we're trying to get to address BF, FF, F6, 4.6, right? So is this gonna work? If we run it from the same directory, right? Yes, hopefully, I mean. But assuming I'm running in the same GDB session, right? I haven't changed anything. Also, yes, <laughs> we say If there's multiple users, um, does do multiple users share the same environment? No, no, no. Your environment is local to you. But the GDB also has its own environment variables that it adds. So your environment when you're debugging things in GED will be different than on the command line. So, uh, also, what else did I say? Oh, also, yeah, so can you, so what if you run a, one of those levels, like level two in GED, and then you exploit it there, are you done? No. Why not? You don't have the set UID permissions on. Yeah, GDB drops, and you try to use the ptrace. Ptrace is, I believe, the debugging interface to programs on Linux. It will drop set UID. So you can debug a set UID binary, but it does not have the permissions of that application. Which makes sense, because you're debugging it, you can literally do anything you want. Okay, so let's see this in action. So we get to here. How do things look? <coughs>
there's a save EVP value on the stack. Is that going to crash everything? Why or why not? Shell code use EVP? No. Our shell code calls exec. We're going to execute a completely new process here, right? Everything's going away, including the EVP register. So, exactly. So, we don't care that we got rid of that value. Awesome. So, but, right, so this is the key thing is even though we've overwritten memory, we still have not controlled this process yet, right? It's still going to move A into EAX. Then we're going to do the lead, which is good. then going to put our 65646362 into EDP. And now it's going to return, which means now our instruction pointer moved from here into here at the very first byte of our shell code. Now our shell code is going to go, and we should be getting a shell. Um, and then everybody's happy. So what was the key here? What's the key behind doing this? So getting, so there's a couple keys, right? So one is making sure you're actually getting, I would very much urge you to think in terms of a surgeon, right? You wanna be super precise. You wanna only provide enough bytes that you need in order to exploit this, right? That is super cool. Right? Anyone can come in with a sledgehammer and like <laughs> break something, right? But somebody who can be very precise and just make the incision that they need in order to get what they want, that to me is much cooler. So we need to know exactly how many bytes, and we can know that just by looking at the, the object dump, right? The code tells us exactly how much byte, how many bytes we need. Right? Our local variable, our buffer buffer will be at some offset of EVP. And that's what we use, plus four for the save base pointer, and we're bang, we're right at save instruction pointer. So we need that, we need, so we need that. What else is the other critical piece of information? Why did it take us three times to do this? Yeah? We need to know where to point EIP. We need to know where to point EIP, right? That is a critical issue, right? So we need to either, Yes or no, right? So there's one actually really cool way to do this. Um, if you, you can actually write a wrapper program that calls exec VE of the program you're trying to target with a null environment pointer. And that will ensure that on every run that environment will be exactly the same way that you want it to be. And then you can pass in your argument just like there through like a C string. So uh, it actually becomes really simple that way. Uh, so that's one nice way to do it, which that will be repeatable 100% of the time. Uh, you know, and you can kind of guess if you've noticed everything, even though we added more arguments, we were still around VFFFF646, right? Um, and that's because of the way we saw the memory layout, right? The top gig of memory is reserved for the kernel. So the process starts at like, I think it's BF, F, 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 and then goes down from there, right? And that's where the stack starts. Um, we're assuming, of course, here, no stack recommendation, right? So you can do it in GDB, and that can give you an idea of where to go. But from what we've seen, we need to be super, super precise, right? We have to hit the first byte of our programs, uh, of our shell code in order to execute. Um, so yeah, same environment is super important. The size of the command line parameters are really important because those will change the stack. Um, you don't have to guess the offset. Uh, I need to change this. You can know the offset exactly by looking at the assembly code. That's the key. So we can use a super cool trick. Essentially, the problem is we need to hit this one byte, right? We need to hit that very first byte of our shellcode to start executing, right? 
So the idea is, well, why don't we increase that window from one byte to n bytes, like 10 bytes? So what do we need about these bytes? You could just use random bytes. You put the bytes random ones at the beginning. And then Ooh, OK, let's think if we did random bytes and then we jump somewhere. Let's say we jumped into like the 10th byte. What's going to happen? It'll interpret those bytes as x86 instructions and probably crash. Or maybe not. I don't know, actually. Um, but it could do something random, right? Which is not really what we want. We want very controlled. Wait instructions over and over again or something? On the right track. Yeah. NOP. So there's a specific instruction on x86 called a NOP. It's hex 90. It's so familiar in x86 that I've memorized the exact instruction code. It is hex 90. It is literally a no-op. It tells the processor do nothing. So if we prepend 100 bytes of no-ops to our shellcode, now instead of getting exactly at that first byte, we only need to get somewhere within that not sled. So it's called a not sled. You can think about it like, as soon as we land there, we're just going to slide right into our shellcode. Ah, but it's at, so the problem is it's at the end, right? So we got to think when it's copied in, when it's copied in, we need to jump right at BFFS646, right? Which is at, if you look at the stack this way, the bottom of the shellcode, which is the very first instruction, right? The A's are at the end of the shellcode, so they're not going to give us anything, and they should never be executed anyway. All right, so we need to somehow extend the front of the shell code down so that it makes this nice sled where if you land anywhere on there, you slide right into shell code. Yes? But why would you ever put A's at the end when you could put knobs at the front? If you put knobs at the end, it'll hit the A's, and then it'll try to execute 65646362 as an instruction. No, because it's executing up. Just get rid of all the A's because it's advantageous to put the knobs at the front. And you still have the Right, right. So I'm saying if you put so it we execute up in this diagram. Right? Yes. So we start executing the shell code. And then we execute up. It's right. just things flip the shell the shell code up. Ah, 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 I see what you're saying. Okay, flip it and then put the A's below the shell code and turn them into knobs. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely what we were doing. <laughs> Yes, very important point, right? Depends on the buffer size. In this case, we only have 50 bytes, so the most we can really extend this is like 29. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, that's still better than one, right? That still gives us a little bit of leeway, right? And we, how many times do we need to be correct? Once. We only need to be correct once. You could write a super easy Python script that just keeps calling it with this and changing uh, the address that you're trying. Right, which would be, let's see, it'd be this, so you could change this byte by 16 or however long your buffer is to try to look for that not sled. Um, that's a cool technique to do. And you can start at a low, I mean, you don't want to start too far down. You can start at like pretty high, like the F, 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 and then just keep going down and eventually it'll hit. Right. No, my still have 29. So, this is exactly the technique that we use as a knock sled. It's super cool. Um, hex 90. So basically, you would have exactly, you would have the knops, you'd have the buffer all the way up to the return address so you can maximize your knock sled. And then, so this is if you're being super imprecise. Uh, you could just overwrite the buffer address, but I really hate this. Um, I really want to change it now. But you want to overwrite the return value with the return address and then the save the IP on the stack, and you're good. So this stack is going like left to right. So exactly this problem, right? What about small buffers, right? So what is the requirement for our shellcode? Uh, 
that again? It should fit within the process name. Mm. Is that one of the requirements? What are the requirements? Yeah. It needs to go and to executable memory somewhere. It needs to be in the process's memory space and it needs to be executable. But it doesn't have to be in that same buffer, right? So if the buffer, I mean, if it's, if the buffer's enough, then yeah, we want to use it, right? That, that'd be silly not to use it. Um, but if we can access the environment, right, as we said, if we can put variables into the environment, right? We control the environment that a process executes in, right? That was the whole basis, basis of path attacks, is because the process uses, excuse me, the environment and the attacker controls the environment. So we could even put a not huge not sled as big as we want plus the shell code into an environment variable and then try to get, so overwrite basically all junk and then just the address we want to overflow and then have that address be inside our not sled somewhere. This is actually can make your life super nice because your not sled can be as big as you want because it's environment variable. There's no limits there. You can literally have it be like a gig of just knobs, which makes guessing a lot easier. Don't do that on the server, please. <laughs> like 512 bytes is totally fine. Or even 10.4, what length is that? 2048, as long as less than a meg, I think we're fine. Uh, there's also cool things you can do. You can put it in other buffers, right? So this trick is great for uh, <coughs> exploiting a local process, right? A local Unix process that set UID will inherit your permissions. But if the process is running remotely and you're accessing it over TCP, you can't control the environment variables there. So maybe you can't, maybe the buffer is too small to put the shell code in there, but maybe you're interacting with this process. Maybe as part of the username to log in, you can put the shell code. Or maybe you can put the shell code somewhere else in memory that's executable. That's the other thing. Why is the environment variable space executable? Because the stack is executable. And it's on the stack. But stacks aren't usually executable, right? Not in the future. So how do you do it in general? Very, very clever. <laughs> you have to understand these techniques to do the advanced stuff. So we're walking through that. We're first doing the um, like standard buffer overflows. Uh, we're going to get into overflowing EIP is not the only thing you can overflow, so there's a lot of different ways to uh, exploit the process to get control. And then we're going to do return-oriented programming, which is the advanced way of how to get around ASLR and non-executable stacks. So, very generally, we, we classify all of these, if you talk to uh, security researchers, we don't really think about buffer overflows so much anymore because while they still happen, um, not quite as prevalent, we think of them more broadly as memory corruption, right? So any vulnerability where an attacker can overwrite arbitrary memory in your process, right? Which is clearly buffer overflow. There are other instances of this. Um, and it depends on what is overwritten. So what are we overwriting? Are we overwriting the return address, the save EIP? There's actually a lot of cool stuff we can do with save EDP. We can actually overwrite save EDP to completely control the process if we can't reach EIP. Uh, it's a cool one. We can overwrite a pointer to a function. Right? So C and C++ have the ability to, pa to pass around function pointers. And so if we overwrite function pointers, we can control the program. Uh, pointers to data. So this is actually a really cool, um, more recently this is getting attention. So the idea is, let's say if on the stack there's a variable that says if you're the admin or not, like a zero or a one, right? And so you're normally not the admin, but if you give a big enough buffer, maybe you can't touch EIP or EDP or anything. But if you can overwrite that value and say, yes, one, I am the admin, now from then on you're an administrator, right? So you haven't corrupted the control flow of the program, but you've corrupted the data of the program in order to get the program to execute a different control flow that you want. Variables, values, oh yeah, pointers to data and also variables to values, these are partial uh, the same. 
So the other thing is, so this is, you classify these all under what is overwritten, right? What is the thing that you're changing? Then what causes the overwrite? Is it unchecked copying, so the classic overflows? Array index overflow, so maybe you can't just copy everything, but maybe you can access out of an array. Integer overflowing, so integers, if you add them too much, they loop around and become negative. So if you're using this as some kind of offset, you can get memory corruption vulnerabilities there. Loop overflows. Also, where are we overwriting? We've only looked up to this point in the stack, but there's also the heap, there's the VSS segment, the data segment. Right? These are all things where you could overflow and overwrite and corrupt memory, and they can all lead to security vulnerabilities. What's VSS? VSS is the uh, initialized data section, I believe. Like the global variable, basically. And the global offset table, as we'll see later. So, this is where it gets really tricky, right? So we said that to understand if something is a security vulnerability, right, we need to understand the program. It's pretty clear that for any program, if you can control the save EIP value, then that's a clear security vulnerability, right? Unless I guess your program is like execute random code in my process space, right? Then I guess it doesn't really give, you don't get any extra privileges. But most of the time, that is clearly a vulnerability. But this is where it takes you thinking about, OK, I can see there's a vulnerability here. Maybe I can corrupt this memory. What does that actually allow me to do? And this is where your critical thinking skills and analyzing the program and understanding what it does really comes into play here. Right? So buffer overflow is a super simple, stupid, just smash it, get it, change it, execute code. This Changing one variable to get it to do what you want it to do is requires much more understanding and skill. So, for instance, like what if you overwrote a pointer to a file that was going to be displayed to the user, and instead of it being slash temp slash t dot txt, it became slash etc shadow, right? And now it's outputting me the etc shadow file, which I can then try to crack passwords on. Uh, integer value. So if there's a way I can overflow some set UID value to change it to be root, to change it to be zero. Um, save base pointer. Uh, this is, we'll talk about this later, so I'm not going to uh, talk about this. Function pointer. So this is, so changing any function pointers. And so normally in a lot of the programs that you write, you don't actually use function pointers. Right? Has anybody written C code that uses function pointers? Some, yeah, it, it happens and there's good reasons to do so, but in your day-to-day -day life, so if you just put an average C program up, chances are it doesn't have function pointers, but every process, how, how does the dynamic linking work in C in, on ELF binaries? So how does static linking work? The code's included. Yeah, the code's included. What about dynamic linking? It's uh, decided at runtime. Loaded at runtime, and there's a global offset table entry that has the pointer to where to jump to where that function's actually located. So actually, if we went all the way back to the program we were looking at for main, when we saw that call to uh, string copy, strcpy, that's actually not in string copy, it's jumping to a trampoline in the global offset table that gets the actual value from a table and then jumps to it. So there are function pointers in memory that we can overwrite of almost any, essentially any dynamically linked program to control the program's control flow. You want to access that table and put something in there. Yes, so if we, for instance, if we have a program that uh, we could overwrite the value in the global offset table of printf, we could then get that, put our buffer with our shellcode in it and have it jump to our shellcode. Is that also called the registry? No. Different? Global offset table. Okay, so for what can we overwrite? 
One cool thing is long jumps. So what are long jumps used for? In C. <coughs> so does C have exceptions? No, not really, right? It just has signals. So when you get a segmentation fault, you get a signal, and you can handle that if your process can try to handle that. Um, but fundamentally, there's no way to like say, hey, throw an error, right? So what do we do? How does error handling work in C? Yeah, so every function has to return an error code, right? So usually, how this is done is like a negative value will usually be returned if there was an error. And then you have to interrogate another variable to figure out exactly what the error it was. But, so when you're calling a function in like Java, let's say you want, you know that that function is going to call some other function that's going to open a file, right? It's throw some exception. So you can throw a try catch block around that. And so when it throws that exception, it will go, the code will execute all the way from where it originally was back to your try catch block. Right? So it's not returning, each thing is not returning an error value. So C doesn't have that by default in the language, so they had to add in the standard library long jumps. Long jumps are this way to essentially do this exception handling of, hey, there was a problem, jump back to wherever, whoever set this long jump, which may, there may be three or four things on the call stack since then, but that's fine, jump all the way back uh, to there. So it's similar to a go-to, but restores the program state to whatever you call that set jump. So the set jump, so there's a pair of calls, the set jump and the long jump. So the set jump saves context for the program. And then if somebody called long jump, it jumps back to that uh, back to that set jump. It's kind of like a fork. Where fork, now you have two processes running, but the difference is the return value. So here, the first call to set jump will set up the context. And then when somebody calls long jump, it jumps back to the set jump return. But the return value has changed, so you know that you're coming back. We'll see an example of that. So yeah, so it's set jump with this context variable returns zero, and a long jump goes back. So when you call long jump with an environment and some integer x, x will be returned from that set jump. So it's used to perform exception, error handling, threading, all kinds of cool stuff that you can actually do here. So if you look at an example, so here we have just a main program. We're using a jump, so this jump buffer, oh, I don't have the, um, I don't know the includes here, but if you look up man set jump, it will tell you exactly which things to include in the man page. Uh, one of those things that it adds is a jump buff. So this is, you can think of it like an opaque object that is storing all your context here. So we're creating this on the stack. We are calling set jump. So the first time we call this, which block here is going to execute, which branch? The else branch, right? So it's going to return zero. It's actually going to print out nothing. It's going to print out garbage because I was never set. So then it's going to call this other function f1 with the environment passed in. It's going to say if some check is an error, then long jump e error one else f2. It's going to do stuff check otherwise long jump. So <coughs> the idea is. Whenever this long jump with error one is called here with this E, now the code will jump back up here, except the return value will be error one. And if it's called from here, it'll jump back here and the, code, the return value will be error two. Right? No matter how many nested calls we are, we'll still jump back to that code and the stack will be cleaned and the registers will all be put back to where they should be. Uh, we don't need to go. Oh, so yeah. So the jump buffer 
has a let's see uh, has a there we go uh, so we look in here when we call a long jump so if we look at the code of what this actually is doing it's putting the value i into eax right so this makes sense so it's putting the value that you have uh, the return value into eax because this is it a function called returns so the return value needs to be in eax then it's restoring the base pointer right so it's accessing this jump buffer and accessing the base pointer offset inside there into edx so it's restoring the base pointer it's restoring the stack pointer and then it's jumping to wherever the program counter is. So fundamentally, so here we have a structure on the stack that is storing the base pointer, the instruction pointer of where we want to go and execute, and the stack pointer. So if we're able to use a buffer overflow to overflow that environment, we can then set up, so you can think about there's an extra saved EIP on the stack where that jump buffer is. And so if we overflow that and then trigger a long jump, we'll jump to whatever code we want to. All right, cool. So it's more complicated, but this is one that you can definitely do that, um, that is very cool. So different type of what you can overflow. Um, yeah, so you need to make sure you can't overwrite sensitive data structures, right? So this is a data structure that literally can control the instruction pointer, the EIP, the EP, and the ESP, so it must be protected. Uh, okay, so now we'll continue this on Wednesday.